Well, good afternoon and good evening, everybody. You are joining the Pearson Center and we're delighted to have you. This is our series, COVID and Beyond, where our webinars are reaching far and wide across the country. A whole bunch of different topics and apologies for that, sorry. <laughs> anyway, but welcome. Today we are delighted because we're going to have a fireside chat with one of our own Ontario ministers in the federal government and she hails from Peterborough Kawartha. That's her riding and her name of course is Marion Monset. So we're delighted to be able to welcome her. She is the Minister for Women for Rural Economic Development and as well um, she's a big supporter of the Pearson Centre so we're really delighted to do that. As part of our fireside chat, we've got a very special guest who's going to be doing this interview. And she herself is a former politician as well, a former minister with the Ontario government, status of women, in fact, and MPP. And she is Nadira. We're delighted. Indira Nadu Harris. Her, now she, she can tell us about what she was doing in the Ontario government as it relates to what she sees our Minister Monseth has been doing federally. But today, after a very successful political career, Indira is now Assistant VP at the Guelph University dealing with diversity issues. So how appropriate for history as well as journalism. So we're kind of bringing back all of your history, Indira, so that you'll do a fabulous job for us. So let's welcome our two guests that are going to be doing the, the uh, yeoman's duty today. And if you have questions when you're listening to our minister talking about the status of women and everything that that means today in a COVID world and a post-pandemic future, send us a question through the question box. You're going to meet our president of the Pearson Center who's going to be dealing with a Q&A at the end of the session. So Indira, over to you and thanks again for your participation. Well, thank you so much, Sandra, for that lovely introduction and good afternoon, everyone. And welcome, welcome, Minister Motsef. Thank you so much for joining us today for this important conversation. You know, Minister Monsef, no question this past year has been a difficult one for all of us between navigating the unique challenges presented by the global pandemic and social isolation to addressing serious inequities in our society. We've all had to work hard to find solutions and keep our families and communities on track during this challenging time. And so I have to say, as Canada's Minister for Women and Gender Equality and Rural and Economic Development, you play a big role, a big role in finding solutions and building supports for Canadians facing difficulties. And some of the most serious problems are the ones, you know, really having to deal with some of your files. So my first quick question to you is, how are you doing? What's it like to be in politics right now under these challenging circumstances because of COVID? Well, Madam Minister, which is how Indira and I met, co-chairing my first federal provincial territorial meeting. It's nice to see you and it's nice to be here with my honorable colleague, um, Sandra Papatello as well. Um, and just politics is weird these days. Life is weird these days. Um, I'm sitting in my basement on Michisagi territory. Um, I'm wearing a hoodie and like, you know, even the way we dress has changed. Uh, Sandra had a photo of the Peace Tower behind her. I don't, I went from constantly seeing the Peace Tower in Ottawa to like not, but it's never been more intense. Tech glitches are real. <laughs> they are the norm and, you know, getting, learning new rooms to be in, right? Politics is about being in the room and having a say and connecting people. It's about shaking hands and rubbing shoulders and photo ops and going to birthdays and things. All of that is done, but you know, I, it's intense, but it's pretty cool to be somebody like me, to be at a table like this, at a time like this. It's, a, it's an honor and it's a responsibility that we all take seriously. And let me also say, it's such an honor to be here with you, with like badass Ontario women rocking it. I'm I'm so glad to be here, Indira, and high five to the folks at Guelph because they're well represented always, and somehow they were they were the first to to offer Indira something pretty pretty freaking amazing. They were oh. quick. <laughs> 
Thank you, Minister Monsef. And, and really, thank you for being so honest about how, you know, it feels these days as, as all of us are facing challenges. And as you pointed out, a lot of the resp responsibility these days are really resting on the shoulders of folks like you. Um, some of the most serious problems right now are absolutely the ones being experienced by women. In fact, experts say that women have been hit the hardest by the COVID-19 pandemic, and they point out that they're at the top of the list when it comes to job losses, reduced work hours, and so on. And, and as a result, people are saying now, experts are saying, that a she session is underway in Canada. So tell me, how bad is it from your uh, perspective for women in our country right now? And what are you doing? What, are the, what is the federal government doing to encourage a she recovery and support for women? Thank you for your very important question, because I think this thing is on the shoulders of the women who are hardest hit by COVID. It's on the shoulders of essential workers, personal support workers who get up every day and even though there is an outbreak in the facility they're working in, they, they go, they, they either have no choice. And so many of them do it because they genuinely love it. This is on their backs. And, you know, 80% of those on the front lines of the fight against COVID are women. 97% of our universal early learning and child care worker to be universal system, our ELCC workers are women, you know, our teachers are mostly women. Our, our women showing up in places like BC, leaving abusive homes, 70% of them presenting with brain injuries. It's, it's on them. And, you know, the, the sad and the scary news is we are losing hard won gains. That's the bad news. Women's labor force participation is declining. And it's almost a year since the pandemic started. It started right away. Women were the first and the hardest hit. Jobs lost, increases in paid, unpaid and paid work, uh, increases in responsibilities. They, they had to stay home to care for their parents or their kids. And then homeschooling started. And then pressure went up and people's mental health shifted and violence went up and the scary men in their lives while well, alcohol is an essential service. So substance use has gone up. And so women and children are less safe than they were when this thing first started. And even in Canada, they were not that well off. The shadow pandemic of gender-based violence is a real thing. So women are losing jobs. It hasn't stopped. It hasn't stagnated. Rates of violence are up. The severity and prevalence of rates of violence against them are up. The older you are, the more at risk you are for COVID and this stuff. Kids are also vulnerable. Women from black, indigenous, racialized minorities, those with disabilities and exceptionalities, the ones who don't have immigration or Indian status, for example, are also among the most at risk. Sex workers are at risk, whether they choose to do it or they have to do it, they are at big risks. LGBT folks, if you had existing health conditions, it's harder. So I could go on and on about what's not going well. I hope, I hope that there's an acceptance that it's just happening and it's not a fight to say it's bad. We're keeping the numbers are telling the story. So what do we do about it? Well, first of all, thank you to Armin Yaliznyan and badass economists like her who are making sure we have these conversations. Armin coined the term she session. She also said there will be no recovery without a she recovery and that universal early learning and childcare is part of it. You know, for all the ways that it's hard to be a woman, I also think that there has never been more of us at the table. We've never had more power. Canada's finance minister for the first time as a woman, Christia Freeland, got her nose to the grindstone on the budget, as you know, and the child care plan. She's the one working with a, you know, pretty open feminist prime minister and a gender balance cabinet. We're not new to government anymore. We've been at this for six years now. We, we handled a very difficult relationship 
with our American counterparts, I think with dignity and grace, and got a good deal for Canadians out of it. We created a million jobs in our first mandate. We cut child poverty rate by 40% nationally, 50% in Alberta. One in two kids not going hungry to bed anymore in Alberta because of what we did in the first election, uh, in the first mandate. A million more Canadians had a place to call home when we told them to stay home. So, so there's a reckoning, I suppose, and Canada's gonna be okay, but it requires us to roll up our sleeves and row in the same direction. So no question, uh, you recognize the important time it is and this moment in time, certainly for equity seeking groups, but specifically for women right now to make sure that the challenges that they're facing and, and certainly being hit uh, you know, very hard as we go through COVID and what people are calling this she session. Uh, I understand your government is doing some things. You've moved $100 million forward in order to try to deal with some of the uh, challenges that women are facing. And tell me about that. What, what are you hoping to do with this funding and where are you hoping to build supports? First of all, there is an additional $100 million on the table right now. The Prime Minister announced Canada's uh, Feminist Response and Recovery Fund last Friday. I highly encourage anybody who's tuned in, thanks for tuning in, by the way, um, to, to go to women.gc.ca. It's there on Francais OC. Uh, and check for yourself what you can do with any funding at all to improve health and safety and to enhance labor market participation and workforce development for women and gender diverse folks. The, the hardest hit of all in COVID, the, the intersecting identities, uh, if you can help those folks get back up on their feet, um, be safer, um, you know, deal with the impact of COVID if you're a think tank or a post-secondary, if you are, as long as you're, you know, a public entity, an indigenous band, a province, if you're interested, or a municipality, we should talk. This money's there to help the women in your community and those kids be better off. So in addition to, to the $100 million for feminist response and recovery, which is still open and call us, there's 1,500 doors across the country that are open right now to women and children in their hour of need. And those doors are open because gender-based violence workers have the safety and the tools they need and the flexibility they need to, to be there and care. And they're awesome and I we salute them. In addition uh, to that, we're building the foundation for that recovery every single day. The income security measures we've put in place, what is it, like 9 million Canadians have benefited from the CERB. It's a form of a basic income, if you'd like to think about it that way. But that's held people together. And I'm not saying people haven't taken on debt and things aren't uncertain for so many, but we're building the foundations, but we're also seeing cracks in the foundation. And budget 2021, uh, there's a consultation open on that too for another 72 hours. This is probably one of the most important budgets in modern Canadian history. The federal government is, is working on that. Christia Freeland and the Prime Minister will have the final say, but this is Christia Freeland's first budget and she's got a pretty amazing partner in crime with Mona Fortier. The two of them are fanning out and we really hope that you'll go on the finance website if you have high-speed internet or reach out to your MP and say, I wanna be part of the pre-budget consultation because this budget matters. This budget matters and there are a lot of cracks showing in our system and those cracks, we can fix them. So that's good, but the bad thing is they are the biggest limit to our economic recovery and growth. If we don't address the recovery in an equitable way, focusing on fixing those gaps, some of them were there before COVID, most just got worse. If we don't, then Canada won't be competitive. But we've got a plan to make sure it's a more inclusive recovery, that it's a more green recovery, and that it's a smarter recovery so that we're better prepared for 
climate change and whatever else, whatever else Mother Nature wants to throw our way. Minister Monsef, you, you touched on a couple of things, but one of the things you talked about is making sure that those cracks in the foundation don't grow and become larger so that we really lose the foundation we've been building over the years. Uh, you touched uh, basically on broadband. Um, you are the Minister for Rural and Economic Development. We're talking about how we build supports for economic recovery across the, the country. Uh, certainly, there are serious challenges for folks living in rural areas right now because you know so many uh, so many of them are having their work shift online and so you touched on that 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 need for uh, critical uh, you know need for strong broadband for rural families tell me what are you doing to help these families and and you know can we build the networks that we need fast enough to deal with this situation right now no we can't build the networks fast enough um, Indira if you don't have high-speed internet right now, life is really hard and COVID is hard enough on its own, right? People aren't doing too well. If, if, if you have decent access, you can get on Wellness Together, which is an app. You can get like counseling and supports, but you know, otherwise you can rely on the phone version, um, which is still there, but not quite the same. If you're struggling and you miss your loved ones in lockdown, you can FaceTime them. And, you know, I, my partner's in New Brunswick and like maintaining a relationship, any relationship across distances is hard, but we're lucky because both Fredrickson and Peterborough are, you know, relatively well off. We have a plan, the best plan we could come up with, uh, which is a plan Canadians ask for to connect every household as quickly as possible. Work is underway. By the end of 2020, because of what we started when we when we first formed government, there were tens of thousands of households who had internet. This year, there will be a quarter million households who will be connected because of what we did in our first mandate. Back in November, the, P the PM also put on the table the Universal Broadband Fund, and this is the single largest investment by government in broadband ever. 1.75 billion dollars to say we're going to get everybody connected quickly and we've got targets and it's a good plan it's flexible we've got a concierge service so we've you know this morning we we announced 1997 households getting connected across like a dozen townships communities um we've announced our first project with the rapid response which will mean 7,179 more households in Alberta will be connected back in December. So we've got a rapid fund with hundreds of applications to sort through and we're making those announcements. And then we've got a bigger pot for fiber, for longer term projects that'll take two, three years, four, five years. And we're at the table as the biggest investor and we're working with the private sector to get that done. So another invitation to anybody hustling on this file and trying to get their community connected, please reach out. The money is on the table and we are, we've got a bunch of smart engineers on our concierge service ready to take your call and help coordinate this because it's a matter of productivity too. How can Canada be competitive in the global economy that just catapulted to telework if we don't have high speed internet? You know, I want to go back to something you touched on earlier, and that was just the, the critical situation going on with gender-based violence. And we're talking about rural areas now and remote areas and that disconnect and connectivity that's needed in these areas. So, you know, I, I have to ask, you know, it must be challenging to support women and girls in living in remote areas when they're living in, in homes that are unsafe. What are you doing to help them and how can we help them uh, when we're dealing with so many other uh, challenges um, by virtue of this pandemic and also that they are living in areas that, that just aren't that easy to connect with and reach? You know, how do we support them? Well, the fact that you're using your platform to ask about them is a big help. And I know you know because you, you've done my job and you know arguably better um indira was like the calm 
mature voice around around the table um for many years on this file and the fact that you know the country is filled with women like you who are you know not going to give up and we know we're part of a movement and we know that it is a very important time for us you know this this conversation is an important conversation on its own because if you go back in 50 years, when a cop came to your door, if you were one of those rural women experiencing increased rates of violence, he would, or any Canadian woman, they would come to the door and say, this is a matter between man and wife because that was the law. He mm -hmm. could keep the children even if he beat the daylights out of her and there was nowhere for her to go and that's changed their shelters and their places to go but in the rural parts of the country in the early days of the pandemic there was an eerie silence from women seeking support in rural communities there are their husbands usually but they were just at home longer with the most dangerous person in their lives and there was nowhere to go. And for some, there was confusion about what was open. There are fewer options in rural communities. Transportation's already a challenge. Shelters aren't as available and you know it's smaller, so people know your business more. But those women now, you know, there are more doors for them. The new legislation we've introduced on gun safety is a big help for them. If those men, in those homes have guns that they don't even have to use. They can just threaten her with. She's even more vulnerable. And we saw what happened in Nova Scotia. We saw what happened in Porto Peak. We saw what happens when, you know, people lose it and decide to commit heinous acts. And they have these hateful, misogynistic tendencies. They will do dangerous things that hurt the whole community. So those rural women, if you're watching this, first of all, know that you are not alone. If you're not safe, you don't have to stay. The government of Canada has your back. There are thousands of doors open for you. Talk to somebody you trust. Reach out to a woman's organization or a YWCA or a YMCA in your community. There is help for you. And you don't have to stay if you are not safe. So, you know, there's an opportunity with developing a national gender-based violence strategy if provinces and the federal government work together. Um, and I really hope we can continue this conversation, Indira. There are a lot of other people who can who can speak much more eloquently than I about this issue, and it's one whose time has come. Honestly, Minister Monsef, you've spoken uh, very clearly and very uh, strongly about the need to support women during these uh, these trying and challenging times. So thank you so much uh, for sharing some of your thoughts with us. We are going to move now to hearing from uh, some of the folks that are watching us and take some questions from our audience. Uh, before we leave this, this topic and on this level, is there any sort of one sentence or one line that you'd like to say to the women who are out there who uh, may be facing gender-based violence or feeling like they're having a hard time making ends meet or dealing with the you know with the extra demands on them because they're working from home and they've also got children and so on you know uh, these are trying and difficult times uh, a final kind of word that you'd like to say to them before we open the questions up to our audience uh, thank you for this so much. I love talking to you. I miss talking to you, Indira. But to those women, too, um, I would say we see you, we hear you, and we've got your back. Thank you, Minister Monsef. And now Andrew Cardozo is joining us. He's with the Pearson Center and is going to be sharing some of the questions that folks that are out there watching right now would like to ask you. So, Andrew, over to you. Thank you, Indira, and uh, welcome, Minister. A few questions coming in online, um, actually several, and I'll try and boil them down into just a few. Um, the first one, on gender-based analysis of federal spending, will there be regular reporting to Canadians? Nice to see you, Andrew, and what a smart question. The short answer is yes. The longer answer is we've been doing that since budget 2017. It's now the law. 
because of a because of a bill we introduced to make sure every budget has an intersectional gendered lens applied where we need to do better is with the consistency and the quality of the plus we're working on it but we need help yeah uh thank you on the next question uh, 10 years ago the federal and provincial governments developed a national child care program will your government use the same approach this time well the last one didn't really work out so not so much but we are in the same boat it's a minority government the whole thing could fall apart but i will say we have never come further on universal early learning and child care in canada than we have with with the last uh five six years there is distinction based frameworks in place for indigenous metis and first nation kids there is children in care enhancements for those most harmed by the system kids there is you know 40,000 new spaces created the approach will be and has been with some of the smartest in the country uh, we look forward to provinces and territories who see child care as a key component of Canada's recovery from COVID there will be no recovery as Armin Yelizion said without universal early learning and child care but fortunately we've started that work a long time ago this budget budget 2021 will be an important one you've heard Christian Freeland the minister on this say I am nose to the grindstone on this and she's excited as a working mom herself that's a pretty big deal that representation absolutely matters and then you know in addition to that you have the honorable minister ahmed hussein if you know ahmed he gets things done and he doesn't stop so we've got a solid team on it dominic leblanc is our intergovernmental minister working to coordinate the nuts and bolts i think he has the most fun job of them all uh negotiating at that table but everybody's working hard on this and the prime minister has made it clear that we're going to do this we're going to do this well the quebec model is a north star for us and we're going to build a system that is worthy of our kids and our parents okay thank you uh, the next question, and this um, follows up from your discussion of what uh, Armin Yelnizian has, has talked about. Um, why is it that women were so unfairly affected by the pandemic and how can we protect, how, how can we protect them in the future? Clarify for me, why were women vulnerable? Is that yeah, the well, question? I, I, I suppose the question is what were the what were the factors that led to women being uh, more adversely affected during the pandemic? And, and um, the, the short answer would be misogyny, racism, colonialism, patriarchy, um, and then slightly longer would be the gender wage gap was still at like 87 cents, uh, the rates of violence, you know, every every other day a woman in Canada was killed before COVID every six days by the by her intimate partner um the the number of jobs unfilled in in sectors like steam fields like trades for example tens of thousands of jobs available but you know women only make up 28 percent of the jobs in places like tech where the high, high wage jobs are women made up 26 percent of the workforce when there's like so many vacancies and these women earn 26 percent less than their male counterparts women have come a long way but even before covid you know less than five percent of the ceos of the wealthiest corporations in canada are women and those women they make 68 cents on the dollar for their male counterparts so you know we have inherited these systemic flaws we've also inherited beautiful democratic institutions that are working and think tanks and you know partnerships and communities and relationships that are working so you know it's not all doom and gloom for us either it's a moment of reckoning at least we know there's a problem black lives matter i don't know more times up like things things are changing so i don't want people to be hopeless in the middle of a plague we've we've got enough to deal with um, but things were hard 
before too because it was only women saying things are hard suddenly we have economists and business leaders say with more consistency and volume that we got to help women because it's better for the economy so that's going to be hopefully one of the silver linings of this god-awful pandemic that we have a reckoning and we atone we built economies on the backs of women the most vulnerable women you know the ones looking after our groceries and doing the cleanings and the ones looking after our loved ones i hope one of the legacies of this pretty historic moment for us a game changer like war is that we do better by women and our kids uh because it's time um, and thank you. And, and the last the last question, I think, sort of builds on what you were just saying, actually, and that's with regards to the change in the U.S. administration. Do you anticipate a more positive um, uh, situation for women going forward, given the kinds of vibes that will come from the United States? So there's no relationship more important to Canada as a country, uh, as a state, than that with uh, America. We have indigenous obligations within Canada, but after that, it's Canada, US, and it's exciting to go into, you know, vaccine rollout and 2021, um, Kamala, you know, uh, just a very exciting time for women everywhere, but also remember that we maintained a productive relationship with the states before uh, this new administration came in, you know, and it was because women, it's not like women's rights stopped. If, if anything, like women pushed pretty hard the last four years. We've had some courageous conversations about unfounded, about our judicial systems, about judges who, you know, tell women to keep their knees together and cops who think women are making up rape allegations. Like, you know, the, the movement that leads to change for women has been loud and it's led to more women than ever getting elected the states had more women in their congress in the last mandate and the last administration so think it's not like things stopped but i'm excited about women's workforce development and labor market participation in the post-pandemic economy i'm excited about the green clean jobs that women are going to be shaping and making money doing and leading because women in canada like catherine mckenna taught me this women are kicking ass on climate in canada and child care yeah. will unlock a whole bunch of other opportunities and so yes it is a very exciting time to be in north america we are so blessed we are so privileged to live in a country like this to to you know share the safe borders we safe and to have the free vaccines and the healthcare workers and the culture of volunteerism canadians are going to be okay but i know it's a hard time um, and i also know that these connections matter now more than ever so i just want to thank you so much for creating an opportunity to to see you Andrew, you were a fixture in the House of Commons. You were everywhere. Um, and it's it's I miss that place and I miss those people and I miss working with people like Indira in person, but soon we'll be able to come together again. And I hope that in the meantime, we've planted a bunch of seeds. We have, and I, I want to thank you for your time. I just quickly want to tell our audience that that uh, tomorrow we'll have another session. We'll have a, a webinar on childcare where the speakers will include Margaret McCain, David Dodge, Kathy Bennett, and Sharon Fernandez. We'll be talking about a paper, a report that, we, that the Pearson Center has put out on child care. And our national conference, will, our annual conference will take place uh, in April, opening on April the 8th with uh, Seamus Regan, Minister of Natural Resources. Uh, but thank you very much, Minister, for your time. Thank you very much, Andira Naidu Harris. Wonderful to have you doing the session today. All the best and, and be safe. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye. Thank you.